Thank you for uh, this uh, very special reception. Who never takes a risk will never have a chance. But if you take a risk, then you take also the risk to lose and not only to win. So I take the risk to come here to the Oxford Union. <laughs> it's a calculated risk. And at the end of the day, or the end of my presentation, we will see if it was a good or a bad risk. I'm very happy to be here with you, ladies and gentlemen, speaking about Oxford. And uh, it is an honor to stand before you, all young people, in the city of dreaming spires. This great institution and the many talented young people that pass through its doors have my respect. Many aspire to come here, but only a few are lucky to get the chance. Life is all about what we do with the chances we are given, but also the chances that we create ourselves. And I wanted to start today with a story about chance. It is the story of one of the biggest disappointments in my life. As you have expected, I suppose, I love football and uh, I was football mad as a boy. I still am. Not a boy, but football mad. <laughs> like uh, a lot of uh, young men and women, it was my dream to represent one day my country, Switzerland, perhaps even to play at the, the World Cup. I played whenever and wherever I could, kicking a ball, whatever, and against the wall, if there was nobody else to play with, coming in late for the dinner. I wasn't so bad either. I knew I worked hard enough and practiced this game, and I could make something out of myself. I could create a chance and to take the risk. And I did it so to go into football. When I was 18, and I was starting my university in Lausanne in Switzerland, I made it all for football. Because I was offered at that time a professional contract by a club still existing and playing in first division in Switzerland called Lausanne Sport. At that time, it was a very top club. For me, for a boy who grown up in the mountains of Switzerland, it would be the same if a career is offered to you in Arsenal, Manchester United, or Liverpool. I cannot describe how I felt the moment I had this contract in my hands. And I got back home, and I wanted to get this change. Chance. And I couldn't. You know why? Because at that time, I was 18 years old. And at that time, in Switzerland, with 18 years, you have not achieved your civic rights. And therefore, I needed, I needed the signature of my father on the contract. And my father, he was a traditional, hardworking man. I loved him. I still love him. From time to time, I speak with him. 
And he refused to sign the contract, can you imagine? He took this contract. My son, he said, you will never earn your living with football. <laughs> he was a prophet. But for me, you can imagine, I was really heartbroken because it was at the time when in Switzerland we played the 1954 World Cup for the Jules Rimet Cup. And there were footballers coming from Brazil, Uruguay, Germany, England, Hungary, uh, Santos, Giafino, Morlock, Lofthouse, Pushkas, all these great players. I could follow them, but I was crying because I have seen that there is not a possibility for me. I still sometimes wonder what would have happened if my father would not have taken this paper away. I don't know. But it was a hard lesson. I took a risk. I lost. I lost at that time. But don't forget that disappointments make us stronger and wiser. They can be opportunities in themselves. And I have learned that there's more to the world of football than just playing. As I look at you today, it is like gazing into tomorrow's world. Society looks to you as the leaders of the future in politics, industry, the arts, sport, and more. The expectation must not be treated lightly. It brings with it responsibility for you that can weigh heavily. You may not please everybody. You may not always make the right choices. And life may not always turn out as you want to do. But that weight of expectation will also drive you to your best. To recognize that an opportunity you get must be guided by a sense of duty and responsibility. I'm grateful to you for this opportunity you have given to me to be here today as part of this fine union's tradition of open debate. By the way, I do not get often the chance to speak directly to a British audience. Well, well, not without the help of the flattering mirror of the British media. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I treasure this chance to show you, to show, to present you who I am and what FIFA really stands for <coughs> by the headlines and the spin. One falsehood, I must address this idea that we at FIFA have something against the United Kingdom and its people. That's not true. That's not true. FIFA's love and my love for the United Kingdom and its culture and heritage is rock solid. It runs throughout my life. Anyone like me who is passionate about politics looks to the mother of all parliaments in Westminster and this nation's vibrant political history. It looks a little bit like Westminster here, I have to say, with the two parts on this side. But it's more space, it's more space. And anyone, anyone like me who is inspired by the arts or edu education looks to Shakespeare, to Dickens, to Oxford, and well, I have been advised not to mention the other blue. I have the right one, I suppose. <laughs> and yes, anyone like me who believes in the values 
of a free and vibrant medium looks to the British press, even if the outcome sometimes makes me question disbelief. But the United Kingdom has contributed so much to our world and therefore so much to mine. FIFA and I are great admirers and friends of this nation, its people, but especially its football. This is the birthplace of association football and what a history of great players, great teams. Manchester United, Liverpool, Spurs, Arsenal, Chelsea, Celtic, Rangers, still in the United Kingdom. And you share your love of these teams with fans all over the world. British football is truly global, bringing people together, breaking down barriers. But it is more, more in football. We applaud the strong stand that English football or British football has taken again against the scourge of racism in football. And racism in our game is a shame. It is a big shame. It is a big shame for any culture, but it's a big shame for our football that we still have this racism in our game. And we can only fight. It's not only education. We must also intervene by punishments. But punishments with just sanctions, financial sanctions, is not enough. We must punish by deducting points or by suspending a team or eliminating a team of a competition. Only that, with such sanctions, we will be able to fight this devil that unfortunately we have here in football. But we have something else here in Great Britain which is wonderful, and this is the International Football Association Board founded in 1886. These are the custodians or the guardians of the laws of the game, making this game so attractive. No changes since more than 128 years. No changes. 11 players offside. Two goalkeepers. Twice 45 minutes to change the field. Okay. The surrounding has changed, but the game itself is the same. And who are these custodians? It is England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, together with FIFA. And this is a big heritage from British and English football to us. But to be here today is something else. This incredible university and its renowned union have aged their names in history. This is a place of ideas, a place to be treasured where we can meet, speak freely, and learn from one another and from the great canon of minds that have made their mark here. Just like football, debate has this awesome power to bring people together. Debate opens our minds to new worlds. It challenges our prejudices. It inspires. Just like football, it makes us better people, hopefully, and makes the world a better place. I have heard you are a very warm and general audience. At least at the beginning, I have heard also some boos. I like that, some boos. Then, uh, then I know that uh, not everybody is happy. And you cannot make everybody happy in the world. This is impossible to do so. Even if you are the boss in football, or if you are the boss of this university, you cannot do it. It's impossible. It's impossible. The British media and FIFA, I would uh, say now, we may call it, a very interesting relationship. Interesting. With that in mind, I will try not to disappoint you. I hope to entertain, to open your eyes to the real world of FIFA and to encourage you about all the dream to work hard for yourself and for others 
and to shine in whatever path you take. To be brave, to turn opportunity into something positive for you and perhaps for the world. You may have already grown used to living and studying here in Oxford. Your senses may have dimmed just a little to the stunning architecture, the inspiring atmosphere, and the reputation of excellence and its past and present creeds. But for those who come here as visitors, as I am with my delegation, it still has such a powerful impact. We are in Eve. It puts things into perspective that remains us of our mortality. Where do we fit in? What can we achieve in the small time we are on this earth? What lies ahead? What must we do to go there? Ladies and gentlemen, the two-day, the day of today, is the passage of yesterday and tomorrow. It's the present. It's a present. And the present, it's a gift. So enjoy every day of your life. Enjoy this very special day. Voila. I almost never had the chance to do anything in life, to never chase my dreams, to never love or lose. I was, I very nearly did not make it past birth. <laughs> Listen to that. I very nearly did not make it past birth. I was born two months early in 1936 in the heart of the Swiss Alps. A premature birth is always a risk given in two days advanced medical world. But in the 1930s, being born prematurely usually only meant one thing, go away. Even as a helpless baby struggling for life, there were some people who were against me. My grandmother, my grandmother, advised my mother to let me go. Oh. I would not be here. To not try to save me, because it was not worse, the trouble. Even if I were to survive, the risk of complication was extremely high. And those complications would have made life even harder for a rural family like my own, already struggling to make ends meet. Looking back, perhaps some of my friends in the British media might have agreed with my grandmother. It's a bad saying. I should not say that. Maybe some would have written columns encouraging my mother to listen to the well-prepared Brit from her mother. No. But my mother took the risk and said, I have to be at life. And I am a fighter. And my mother, too, was a fighter. So the risk she took at least paid out Then now I'm still alive. And my mother told me, to never give up on what you believe in. I was given the chance at life, and I grasped his life with both hands. I have realized at school that I wanted to go forward. I tried even, and I did it, but I had to take the risk to ask the teacher that I can go from one class to jump another one and to try to get higher. I took the risk. I did it. It was a very calculated risk. You have to take a leap of faith, faith in yourself, faith in your values, faith in the world. 
and optimistic, the optimistic spirit. You know that optimists, they live better and longer. That's true. I am an optimist. But coming back to my love for football and this love that has shaped so much my life, it is my deep love for the game that gave me the drive and then the opportunity to work for FIFA. I started in February 1975 and then eventually become its president. Contrary to what you may have heard, it is a job, it is a mission. I give my heart, my soul. It was not being without cost, but it's a job I feel so privileged to have. Football has always been everything to me. I was married to the job. I was married to football, married to FIFA. Finally, I was able at least to give life to one daughter. Uh, so I'm not alone in the family of FIFA. I have some family people with me. But I have very few regrets. And I feel lucky to have come so far from those early days and struggle until all these disappointments. Lucky enough to have served a lifetime dedicated to the greatest sport on the planet. It's not rugby, it's not cricket, it's just association football. Luck, lucky enough to be there in the crowd when history is made at the greatest show on earth. No, not the varsity boat race, not Glastonbury, the FIFA World Cup. I expect you all might have an opinion of me or of FIFA. It is difficult to work at the top of any industry without people having their views, without making some enemies as well as friends. And you will know for yourselves that our enemies often have the loudest voices. I hope your education has taught you to have a healthy scepticism and what you hear and read. I hope you have learned to recognize the vested interest, the bias, and sometimes willful ignorance. I hope you have learned to judge things on your own terms, knowledge and experience, to see and recognize the truth, to walk the path less trod. Perhaps you think you know who I am, what FIFA is, what we do. Perhaps you think I am a restless parasite sucking the lifeblood out of the world and out of football, the godfather of the FIFA gravy train, and out of touch, heartless schmoozer. There are not many names that the media haven't thrown at me in the last few years, and I would be lying to you if it did not hurt even if you know that it goes with the territory. You would have to have heard of stone for it not to hurt. You ask yourself what I have done. Why has it come to this? In FIFA, is FIFA to blame for everything? Are we not just a football organization working for the good of the game? How did it come to this? People like a scapegoat, of course. But how could things have become so twisted? As you can see, I am not some overbearing bully who can intimate my critics with one look and strong arm governments to my will. But sometimes it feels like all that unsunk good work FIFA is working to achieve through investing in football, and communities around the world has been washed away in the thoughtless swipe of the pen. I know I'm far from perfect. Perfect does not exist. And that we at FIFA must always look to get better at what we do. Just to tell you, there's a saying, nobody is perfect. So if you say, I am nobody, then you are perfect. 
but don't adopt it because perfection really does not exist. We have worked to push through tough reforms to improve the way FIFA operates to make us more accountable and more transparent, to build up our defenses against wrongdoing and poor business practices. And we know that we have been let down by actions of a few in the football world who have tarnished FIFA's good name and overshadowed all the good work we do. And we know there is fair criticism that we must listen to, and we do. We know we have had some dark days, but honestly, some of the criticism just astounds me. And that is what hurts, to know that it's not true and not fair, that it's easier to plant an idea than it is to change it. That it's easier to, for people to sustain a stereotype than to admit things are changing, or that they have got it wrong. When you leave these hallowed surroundings and dive into the mystery and trials of life, you will soon find that people's opinions of you rarely reflect the truth. Don't believe everybody. Some may exaggerate your strengths and your achievements, some may exaggerate your weaknesses and your failings. You will wonder why it will hurt when people get you wrong. But you must learn to look behind this hole of mirrors in which you see yourself and in which the world sees you. You will eventually realize that these mirrors are but a strange reflection of reality, of what you and others want to see, but not really itself. There will always be doubters, and there will always be people they don't believe. People are guided by their prejudices and naked ambitions, and will do anything to get their way. And there will be always those who make fair criticism and deserve your air. In time, you will learn to accept the criticism when it is fair and to dismiss the flattery and the poison. Perhaps you will learn one day to be your own best critic and to focus wholly on your mission in life. With hard work, perseverance, and good heart, you will make progress. But I'm here today to challenge your perceptions of me and FIFA, how we as a society form opinions of events and institutions, and how our perceptions of the world are shaped often behind our control. Today I want to let you into some of the biggest secrets in the world of sport, the work that FIFA actually does. You will have heard that the world of FIFA is one of secrets and intrigue. Well, to them, today I'm going to open the door to this mysterious world, the hidden ways and clandestine operations of Sepp Blatter, that's me, and the world's governing body of football. You are going to get the exclusive. Today you will hear things you probably will not believe, things that might influence your view of FIFA and me. Perhaps. You may think you know who I am, what I stand for, what I'm like. All those names, all that rumor, all that criticism. You may think you know what FIFA is, what it does, what it aspires to be, a faceless machine printing money at the expense of the beautiful game with me pulling the strings and laughing all the way to the bank. It's not exactly that. But there are those who will tell you that football is just a heartless, money spinning game or just a pointless kick about on the grass. There are those who will tell you that FIFA is just a conspiracy, a scam, accountable to nobody, and too powerful for anyone to resist. 
There are those who will tell you of the supposed sordid secrets that lie deep in our Bond villain headquarters in the hills of our Zurich. You know Bond, permission to kill, where we apparently plot to exploit the unfortunate and the weak. They would have you believe that I sit in my office with a sinister grin, gently stroking the chin of an expensive white Persian cat <laughs> as my terrible sidekicks to host the World Cup and to hand over all the money. Yes, I agree that you may laugh about that. It is strange how fantasy easily becomes confused with fact and it feels almost absurd to have to say this. But it is not what we are. That's not FIFA, that's not me. I have dedicated my life for the good of football around the world in the belief that football has the power to build a better future. FIFA exists to develop the game for around the world, not to exploit it. Because we love the game, recognize its power, and feel a strongly duty to society. It's education, it's a school of life. Even so, I did not make it as a professional footballer. I did not give up on football. I played as an amateur or semi-professional 30 years in Switzerland, and I still have the bruises to show for it and to play and to kick. I have spent the last four decades working to develop football and over the world for all those who want to play, to entertain, and to unite people, bring people together through football to make football the number one sport in the world. The first international course I organized, it was in February 1976 in Addis Abeba. And, and just as an anecdote, the uh, instructors, they came from Great Britain in this first international development program. But I know that football can do something to society and not to take. In this first course, I have seen that football is more than just kicking a ball. And what football can mean for a country or a continent like Africa, more than a game. I know how important it is to inspire and to encourage people to see beyond. When I was a young man, we had to work very hard. But this has been a wonderful apprentice for me. I have never forgotten where are my roots and where I'm coming from. My father was during 40 years a chemical plant me mechanic playing or playing working in a small village in the mountains of Switzerland. And he has always his working blue. And that's why we in FIFA, we are in blue. Today we have the dark blue tie for very special reasons. Then in 1986, when I was voted in the position of FIFA president, and it was a risk that I have taken, because they don't want it to have me as a secretary general for the future. There was a change in the FIFA's presidency, and people coming in, they said, we won't change the president, was Joao Avalanche, and the secretary general. <laughs> I wanted to stay. They said, no, we don't want you. We want another. So I had no other opportunity to go for the presidency. This was a risk. It was quite a gambling, but it was a risk. I took the risk and I won. I won and then I could start with the development of football, with the financial assistance program to FIFA, with the goal projects which go, go all around to those they needed, and especially to organize a World Cup, and to organize a World Cup in Africa. Can you imagine that one day a World Cup would have been organized in Africa? It was a question of trust and confidence, ladies and gentlemen. We trusted Africa, it was South Africa. 
to organize the World Cup. They did it, and they did it well. What was the result about that? The recognition of the African continent, the recognition that Africans, they can be so good, as all other organizers of the World Cup, they have been in the Americas or in Europe. This was, this was a kind of historical achievement. And I can tell you, the next organizer of the World Cup, which is uh, Brazil, they will have to work very hard uh, to match the excitement and the success of the World Cup in Africa. Now, it is also said that we take out the money from sponsors and marketing partners and television. No, with the World Cup, we generate money, and we bring this money back to the development of football. 70% of all income of FIFA goes directly back to the national associations, to the confederations, in projects, development projects, and competitions. Competitions under 17, under 20, for ladies, or for girls, and for boys. For the ladies, we have now the Olympic tournament. We have a World Cup with 24 teams. We play indoor football. We play beach soccer. All these competitions all around the world are linked with the World Cup. And without the World Cup, we couldn't do it. There are some criticism by saying the World Cup it's too expensive, but we have never, never forced somebody to organize the World Cup. Uh, so far, the people, they wanted to organize the World Cup. And the World Cup, and it has been shown, is a magical economic stimulus for the host country, for tourism, architecture, and the legacy they have. It's not only a stadium, it is the infrastructure in the countries, and on the other side, FIFA with its, its programs, Football for Health and Football for Hope, is trying to let a legacy, a cultural legacy, in each of the countries. The financial, the financial support of uh, FIFA is one thing. But more than that, it is the social cultural activity of FIFA. And this is the education through the game of football, which is a school of life based on discipline, respect, and fair play. It is a combat game, ladies and gentlemen, but a combat game in the spirit of fair play. So if we can bring res discipline, respect, and fair play into our society, then we have reached something very important, the school of life. And with our programs for health, our program for hope, we can play a big part. We bring people together. We try now in political, political dimension to solve problems between Israel and Palestine in order that they can play together. We have another problem which is on the island of Cyprus, north and south, and we try to bring them together. If I tell you that actually football is played in, uh, in Syria, football is played in Syria, but football is also played in refugee camps of Syria that I have visited, 120,000 people in one camp in, in Jordan, and football is played there as well. Football, constructing bridges, bringing people together. The national team of Bosnia and Herzegovina just qualified for the World Cup. This country, Herze uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, has still three, three different ethnic groups. In football, they came together. And it is the national team that brought them together. And it was not the qualification for the World Cup. But the qualification of the World Cup, in my opinion, was the result to have a united nation bit behind the team. And there is no better ambassador for any national, uh, for any team, for any nation in the world to have a national team. The national team players are ambassadors. They play with the colors of the 
national association of the of the country. Uh, they bear the flags and they sing the national anthem. These are the best, the very best ambassadors for any countries. We have 209 associations in FIFA. Tomorrow we have the, uh, the privilege uh, to be present in London for the 150th anniversary of the Football Association. It was the first association founded in FIFA. And with all our work we are doing in FIFA, we need the support of everybody. Because the football is this game with 300 million participants, active participants in the world. 1.2 billion fans, they are directly involved in our game. It is a wonderful opportunity. It is naturally a big popularity, but it's more than that, it's also a big responsibility. And we have to take care of this game. This game is also, they have enemies or devils coming into game, violence, doping, match fixing, racism, as I have said. And we have to fight all that. But with the exception of match fixing or manipulation of matches, which is a part of our own FIFA, because we started with this game where everybody wants to go in, all the other aspects, doping, violence, corruption, racism, they are in our society, and our society brings it to FIFA, to the football, to association football. We have to fight to take them out. But it's not easy because it's a game. In a game, there are so many gamblers and so many people, they want to win by all means. And that's why it is difficult to, let's say, to lead the FIFA. If I'm looking at your parliament, I spoke at the parliament at the beginning uh, here in uh, London. And if I look at your prime minister, he has a government which has been elected. He has been, the, this government is elected by the party. They are in charge of, this, of uh, the, uh, the parliament and they have the, the um, government, the ministers. My ministers are not elected by the same entity that the FIFA president. The FIFA president is elected by the Congress of FIFA. But the members of my parliament, my, uh, uh, I would say we call them executive committee members, but by the way they are ministers, they are elected by Africa, by Asia, by Europe, by the Americas, by Oceania, and they don't have the same idea of football. So to bring all these people together, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. So I envy your prime minister, David Cameron, I sent him a, a message of uh, respect. He has an easier work than I have in FIFA. But <laughs> yeah, definitely, but we try, we try to do the best, we try to do. But it's only in solidarity and discipline that we, we can do it. And finally, the FIFA, with uh, the institution FIFA, is now a big institution. It is also an industry, if we have a look on the economic power of our game, all the money that is involved in our game. So when we are speaking about development of the game and touching the social, cultural part and the economy, then automatically we have a, a political dimension. But we shall not have politics inside the FIFA, but we need the politics to help us to organize the game, not specifically to organize the game, but to fight against all the devils that are in our game. We have no police force to go against violence. We have no police force against match fixing. But we have the right in football when it comes to racism, and I have to insist again, we have to write with our disciplinary committees, we have to write to enter with harsh punishments. 
And that we have to do. We cannot ask the society to help us. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to give you a kind of uh, aperçu of what uh, the FIFA is and what the FIFA president is doing there since practically 39 years. And uh, my next term, or my term, will finish in 2015. If you ask me if I will go on or not, I cannot answer today because we are still two years before the next elections. So uh, for the time being, I have to ensure that the, uh, the task that I have been given, it shall be uh, carried out. And then later on, we will see what I can do. So I took the risk now uh, to uh, speak with you, uh, to try to entertain you a little bit, to give you uh, some ideas about football, about offside and 11 players. I just want to say a few words on offside because there is the biggest, biggest discussions on offside, passive offside, uh, active offside, the Beckenbauers, the Pelés, and, and the Platinis, and all the former players, they are speaking about what is offside. The referees, they have uh, seminars, and they never come to a solution. I have one solution, the offside. It's very easy. Make sure that in your life you are never offside, and then you understand <laughs> it. <laughs> bon. Having said that, I took the risk. I took it. I am not a gambler, but I'm a player. I am a football player. I played the game with you. I am happy that you were listening. Some of you were reacting, but I have seen nobody sleeping. <laughs> and and this, is, this is quite an achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>